Good to have you with us this morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started today with the criminal trial of former President Donald Trump, who is due back in a Manhattan courtroom for the second day of jury selection. Yesterday, Mr. Trump came face to face with some of the potential jurors who could decide his fate in the hush money case. Though on day one, the judge dismissed nearly half of them. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records. They're related to an alleged payment made to silence adult film star Stormy Daniels about an alleged sexual encounter in the run-up to the 2016 election. Trump has denied any wrongdoing and criticized the trial following yesterday's proceedings. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues and it continues forever. And we're not going to be given a fair trial. It's a very, very sad thing. We've got a team standing by to talk more about the legal and political implications of this historic trial. We're going to start things off with NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Sugian, who's outside the courthouse, and our legal analyst Danny Savalos, who's here with us on set. Good morning to both of you. So, Yasmin, let's start with jury selection. Lawyers get to pose questions to those prospective jurors about their views, about their schedules. What kind of answers did we hear yesterday, and at what point could we actually see jurors selection selected as opposed to just dismissed? So we started with 96, started the day with a pool of 96 jurors. By the time they actually got up and going, we were about two and a half hours into the day. Um, it was immediately reduced to 34 jurors, um, I believe, and that was because of the two questions that were asked at the top. Um, do you have any interferences that would keep you from showing up to trial over the next six weeks? A lot of folks raised their hands there. And then subsequently, can you be impartial? A lot of folks raising their hand there saying they cannot be impartial. And that is why Judge Juan Marchand um, subsequently uh, dismissed them. So they started off with a jury pool essentially then of 34. They got through 10 jurors, although now there are only nine seats because one of those jurors was in fact excused and it was because of a question about whether or not they had strong opinions about Donald Trump. It was juror number three at the time and was asked if they had strong opinions about Donald Trump. The juror said yes and Judge Juan Marchand immediately then excused um, that juror. I will say uh, that Trump's attorneys, Todd Blanche, actually took issue with excusing that juror. And I was looking through kind of her because it was a female um, profile is who she was. She lives in Harlem, um, is from Texas, works in retail, has an MBA, um, no children. Um, and then also where she gets her media from, Google, TikTok, uh, Al Jazeera. That was also a, a question that I thought was interesting going into jury selection yesterday. And I was taking a look at some of the jurors so far that they've gotten through, all of them saying New York Times, USA Today, CNN. I've seen a lot of New York Times and um, CNN as well. So those were kind of some of the questions that they've been getting through so far. And just to kind of give you a scope, guys, of how long this is going to take, we're looking at a possible runway of um, two weeks with some possible days off there for, for Passover. But if you think about just how long it takes to get through just 10 jurors by 4.30 p.m. yesterday, that tells you how much longer it could take to actually seat a jury. Danny Svalos, that's exactly what I want to ask you about. Could we see this process take longer than usual, given how high profile it is? And what did you make of what happened yesterday? Yeah, I was taking the over two weeks of jury selection. I think that wasn't enough. It mm. might be more than two weeks. The court isn't working every day. But yesterday was a little unusual in that there were a lot of motions and arguments in the morning. And we really didn't get to jury selection until well into the afternoon. But just getting through 10 jurors gives you an idea of how tedious jury selection can be. It's tedious even in a run-of-the-mill case involving a defendant you've never heard of. In a case like this where everybody has at least heard of the defendant, uh, it's going to be really tough to distinguish between people who know of him, maybe have opinions about him, but then also people who can set aside those opinions and decide the case on the facts and the evidence. It's going to be a tough slog. So as Danny just mentioned, it wasn't just jury selection yesterday. So Yasmin, let's talk about some of the rulings we got from the judge. We know Mr. Trump's attendance at the trial is now mandatory, but it looks like the former president did get some maybe minor evidentiary wins concerning the infamous Access Hollywood tape and his deposition tape in the E. Jean Carroll sex abuse case. Real quick, what can you tell us about those? Yeah. So, so Mershon had already ruled on the admission of the Access Hollywood tape, but Steinglass, um, one of the attorneys for the people, 
um, brought that up again, wanting admission of the Access Hollywood tape to kind of set the scene as to how desperate they were at the final days of the 2016 election and why they would um, go through this hush money ordeal with both Stormy Daniels and Karen, Karen McDougal. Um, Judge Juan Marchand decided that they cannot play the Access Hollywood tape for the jury, however they can use the transcript. Um, that was kind of one win um, for the president. The other is the one that you mentioned, is the admission of his deposition for the E. Jean Carroll um, case. The judge also saying that was prejudicial to provide that evidence um, to the jury, so would not allow that evidence um, to be provided. So some minor wins for the former president yesterday when it comes to some of the um, evidentiary hearing that, that they went through. Um, but nonetheless, I'm sure we're going to see more of that. And just one other date, guys, that we got to look out for, and that is the 23rd. That's next week, Tuesday, where they're going to be hearing as to whether or not Donald Trump violated the gag order. Danny, let's bring you in on that. So prosecutors are pointing to something that was posted on social media. What could happen here? Judge is setting a gag order hearing for next week. A lot of folks have wondered why. I, it made a lot of sense to me. If I was the judge, I might have done the same thing. And I, I don't know exactly his thinking, but it probably went something like this. If you set the hearing next week, then he, if he misbehaves between now and then, you can kind of consolidate everything mm. and do it all at once. But I think far more likely, Judge Mershon, by all indications, wanted to get started. We've got hundreds, if not thousands, of people here uh, waiting to get to jury selection. We want to get a move on. We've been in motions and arguments all morning. Let's just table this and let's start picking jurors. We have a lot of work to do, folks. I think that's probably why the judge set this off, put it to next week, so he could at least start taking a bite out of this process that really could drag on for weeks and weeks if he doesn't get it under control. All right, Danny and Yasmin, thank you both. Appreciate it. Let's now get to NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. He's going to join us on the political implications of the trial. Mark, thanks for joining us this morning. So Trump now required to attend the trial in person, as we just heard a moment ago. This could go on for at least six weeks. Of course, this is during a time when Trump could be making his rounds in some battleground states, just continuing that campaign on the ground as we lead up to November. Has his campaign indicated how they plan on navigating all this, I mean, we have also seen these courtroom appearances sort of turn into almost political campaign moments for the former president. What do they make of this? Yeah, Savannah, on the surface, this is a significant disadvantage for Donald Trump. He's going to be ceding the battleground campaign trail to President Joe Biden. And even today, President Biden heads to battleground Pennsylvania, where he's going to actually spend three days in that crucial swing state. Um, the way that Donald Trump and his campaign are gonna navigate this is use the weekends to make their own campaign treks. And so just last weekend, we saw the former president in Pennsylvania. Next weekend, his campaign says they're gonna be in battleground North Carolina. But as you mentioned, Savannah, uh, the trials Monday through Friday allow for the former president to say his own piece. And so I think that in addition to yesterday, today's brief comments that we heard from the former president, we might end up hearing extensive comments and press uh, and Q&As um, before and after the hearings. So, Mark, a recent New York Times Siena College poll found views about Trump's guilt or innocence in the hush money case are divided along party lines. Well, independence views on the case are split down the middle. Perhaps no surprise. That's what America looks like nowadays. What do you make of all that? Just how badly does Trump need to win over these independent voters? And how could this trial impact their opinion of him? Yeah, this uh, trial could actually end up uh, having a very, very impact on those persuadable voters in the middle. And Joe, in addition to those independents who are kind of in the middle between thinking that Donald Trump is guilty or not guilty, 25% said that they didn't know enough information. And so we're going to find out over the next six weeks or even longer uh, what uh, how, how people might be able to make up their minds. And so we, I think, have kind of got caught in a system where, well, yeah, Republicans and Democrats have both made up their minds about the former president Donald Trump. But that persuadable middle is worth watching over the next several weeks. Mark, this hush money trial might be the only one that we actually see get underway or have any type of actual resolution by the point of getting to November. Is this a make or break moment for the former president in terms of his political viability and what happens next? 
Yeah, it, you know, again, we sometimes end up having these huge conclusions about make or break moments for Donald Trump. But I do think this is big on how it ends up playing out. And again, going back to the point I was just making to Joe, uh, there are independents who probably are persuadable on this particular issue. And Savannah, it is worth knowing that we ended up seeing the legal drama end up helping Donald Trump with Republican primary voters uh, in that uh, in his successful uh, campaign for the Republican presidential nomination. But now we're a different terrain. This is general election voters. And I think we all need to keep an open mind on how this might play out when it comes to public opinion. Certainly. Smart and measured response. Mark, thank you so much. Israel is vowing to strike back after Iran attacked the country with hundreds of drones and missiles. Yeah, an Israeli official is now telling NBC News a response could be imminent. President Biden urged restraint from Israel, but also reaffirmed his administration's commitment to the country in its war with Hamas, as the White House seeks to prevent a wider war in the Middle East. We're committed to a ceasefire that will bring the hostages home and preventing conflict from spreading beyond what it already has. But as the humanitarian crisis worsens in Gaza, protesters are demanding the U.S. specifically stop supplying weapons to Israel. A group of demonstrators shut down the Golden Gate Bridge for five hours Monday. That was just one of a series of protests that took place across the country. In Chicago, police arrested about 40 people for blocking traffic at O'Hare International Airport. For more, we're joined by NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley, who is in Beirut. So let's start by talking about that warning that an Israeli response response to Iran's attack could be imminent. What are you hearing and do we have any idea what that response could actually look like? Yeah, guys, I'm not hearing anything additional to what we heard from that response, which was predictably quite ambiguous, as you'd hear from any operation of military nature, especially something like this. Uh, they mentioned that there was the Israelis, uh, that they would want to respond in proximity to the Iranian attack. Now, again, that's pretty ambiguous. What does proximity mean? That could be in terms of timing. So they want to do it sooner rather than later. That could be in terms of geography, that they would want to strike Iran itself. But we have been hearing, in addition from the Israelis, that they may be using the their attack to strike other Iranian proxies throughout the region rather than Iran itself. Now, that was what made this attack by the Iranians so unprecedented that it was fired for the first time from Iran proper, not from Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, or the Hashid al-Shabi uh, in Iraq, all these Iran-backed proxy groups. So it seems as though Israel might be attacking proxy groups instead of Iran itself, clearly a bid to avoid an escalation that the entire world is dreading. But that that, if they do that, could put places like this where I am now, Lebanon, in the firing line. Hezbollah on the southern border of Lebanon with Israel is by far Iran's strongest uh, operator against Israel and could become the subject of its attack. Guys. Matt, we've seen some interesting things happen within the region as a result of this growing conflict. We have countries like Jordan coming to Israel's defense while also being critical of Israel's military assault on Gaza. Tell us more about how Arab countries in the region are dealing with this recent escalation. Well, I think the short answer is here that they're not really, because they're not going public about this. They're not discussing this to their populations, to their own domestic, uh, you know, publics who are going to be very, very angry because uh, anger against Israel has spiked over the past six months, ever since Israel's incursion into the Gaza Strip that has now killed well more than 30,000 Palestinians. But the country among those three, there's Jordan, there's Saudi Arabia, and there's the United Arab Emirates. The country with the most skin in the game by far is Jordan. It shares a border with Israel. Its airspace was used, and we don't know exactly how, because there's been differing in accounts, um, by foreign governments, by the United States, France, and Britain, to shoot down some of these Iranian missiles and drones. Uh, and there's differing reports, but it sounds as though Jordan may have participated in shooting down some of these projectiles themselves. But now the Jordanians are coming out and trying to say that this was a defense of Jordanian sovereignty. This wasn't necessarily them protecting the Israelis, which would be deeply, deeply unpopular within Jordan. But now, we just heard on CNN yesterday, the Jordanian foreign minister said that no matter where a projectile was coming from, if it crosses over Jordanian territory, the Jordanians are going to shoot it down. Now, that could be a major problem. They said that even Israel, if Israel fired over Jordanian territory, the Jordanians would shoot down their missiles and drones. 
Now, depending on how or whether Israel decides to retaliate, that premise, that notion by the Jordanian foreign minister, which again was public on CNN, that's about to be tested in a very, very real way. The Jordanian foreign minister says they're going to shoot down an Israeli counterattack against Iran. They may have to actually be held to that. They may have to actually turn their guns against the Israelis. The analysts I've been talking to say that is very, very unlikely. Guys. All right, Matt Bradley. Matt, thank you so much. For more now on the Biden administration's response to the Iran attack on Israel, we are joined by NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. Hey, Peter, so Israel's allies, including President Biden, are urging restraint here, but it does look like Israel plans to move forward with some kind of response. What are you hearing from the White House, and what do we know about that response at this point? Well, let's start with what we heard the president say to Benjamin Netanyahu in their last conversation over the weekend, effectively trying to urge this idea of restraint, saying, take the win here. The damage could have been much worse in Israel. This could have escalated quickly into a wider war. The U.S., according to multiple officials, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're speaking to right now, is expecting this response to be, as they describe it to us, limited in scope. But among the most likely options right now is that there would be strikes against Iranian, uh, the Iranian military, or more specifically, its proxy outside of Iran, perhaps in Syria, but not in Iran, which really would sort of raise the stakes here and escalate this much further to this point. Those are among some of the options right now. U.S. officials tell us they have not been briefed specifically on what the Israelis are considering doing at this point. They say the options could have changed in the time since. But uh, among the considerations for the Israelis, according to these U.S. officials, was sort of a wide spectrum from, on one end, no military action whatsoever, uh, and on the other end something that could include strikes inside Iran. Again, something that the U.S. has largely been counseling Israel to avoid altogether right now. But this is a, a very delicate situation. The White House has been engaged very heavily from the very start of this. They do not expect, according to these officials, that whatever strikes the U.S. takes would focus on senior Iranian military officials. You'll remember that strike that first hit that consular building, the embassy complex in Damascus in Syria, where all of this began just a couple of weeks ago. That did kill several senior Iranian commanders. So, so Peter, that. we know the U.S. won't take part in any offensive actions against Iran. Is the White House expected to do anything else to sanction Iran for Saturday's attack? What can be done? Well, it's a good question, and we have been posing those questions to administration officials. We just heard yesterday from the National Security Council spokesperson John, uh, spokesperson John Kirby on this very conversation on the alliances that have uh, fortified in support of Israel and its effort to try to deter Iran from any further attacks. And here's part of what John Kirby told us. Take a listen. Much of the world today is standing with Israel. When the president spoke to the G7 leaders yesterday, they were unified in their condemnation of Iran and their determination to hold Iran accountable at the president's direction. Our teams are now following up with G7 capitals on new multilateral sanctions to target Iran's missile and other nefarious programs. G7 countries that had yet to designate the IRGC a terrorist organization are now considering doing so. And going forward, we will be working to further isolate Iran internationally and increase economic and other forms of pressure. Again, John Kirby yesterday speaking to reporters here. The, the, the main words to take away from that are a desire to further isolate Iran during this time. The next several days are going to be worth watching. We're going to be keeping a close eye on the deliberations here behind closed doors as well. Back Absolutely. to you Absolutely. We know you will. Peter Alexander, thank you so much. Across town on Capitol Hill, House Speaker Mike Johnson says that he plans to advance the stalled military funding for Israel and Ukraine in a vote this week. The Republican-controlled House of Representatives is also expected to send the articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate today. This is over his handling of the situation at the southern border. About to cover, joining us now for more on both stories is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. Ali, good morning. So let's start with what could be a break in that long month long stalemate over foreign aid funding due to divisions really within the speaker's own party. The House now expected to take up separate bills to provide aid for Israel and Ukraine. So what do we know about these bills? How soon could this happen? 
Look, this was already a mess messy situation, guys. The way that Speaker Johnson is now trying to attack it has multiple different prongs to it. And what one Republican member told me is the sense they got from the Speaker in a closed door meeting yesterday was the reason they're breaking it up is because it's just important that some form of this military aid pass. Now, when you do it in chunks like this, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and then a fourth bill that is sort of filled with other Republican foreign aid uh, priorities, including the potential for something that we've talked about a lot, which is not outright giving Ukraine aid, but instead giving it to Ukraine in the form of a loan, specifically through frozen Russian assets. That's one of those bills that might be in that fourth tranche that we end up seeing the House vote on. But look, this is still a tricky situation for the Speaker, because it wasn't just the question of how they voted on the aid, but the aid itself that could alienate key members of his conference and trigger a motion to vacate. So all of the foreign policy politics are still very much muddled with the House Republican politics. And I got to tell you, we're still hearing from people like Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who say she doesn't like this. The question is, does she not like it enough to actually trigger that motion to vacate? Mm. That hangs over all of this, even as urgency mounts for this aid to actually get out the door. Ali, let's also now talk about Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, as I had mentioned. So House Speaker Johnson is expected to send these articles of impeachment later today. But this came after Senate conservatives asked for a delay last week. Walk us through what we've seen so far. Why did they delay the process and what do you think we'll see happen? Yeah, it's a little bit of Groundhog Day when it comes to actually transmitting these articles of impeachment against the sitting Homeland Security Secretary. Initially, you're right. This was supposed to happen last week. And then after pressure from some conservative hardliners on the Senate side, the House side said, OK, we'll wait a few days. We'll do this next week. The key from the Senate conservatives that I was talking to was, A, to make sure that this wasn't a trial that started on a Thursday, which it would have yesterday, which it would have last week. And Thursdays are typically days that senators like to go go, all right, we're getting out of town and we're going home. Instead, doing it on a Tuesday allows them the rest of the week to apply pressure on Senator Schumer, but that pressure isn't taking them anywhere. And frankly, that's one of the questions that I asked the senators. I said, hey, have you guys talked to anyone who's going to be voting differently on Tuesday than they would have on the prior Thursday? I got a little bit reamed out in the room for that one because the reality is they don't have the votes for an actual conviction in this trial, but instead they're just pushing for the trial itself. Yeah, I mean, Schumer has already said he plans to move to dismiss missed the charges. 43 senators wrote a letter to him urging him to hold a full impeachment trial. What is Schumer required to do? Well, look, he's going to do this as quickly as possible within the rules, though those conservative senators say that the rules are that you need to hold a trial, that the defense witnesses need to be in there, that the person who's actually being impeached needs to be subpoenaed and thusly in the room. All of those things are not happening. We don't expect the, the defense attorneys for Mayorkas to be there, certainly not Mayorkas himself. And I think the reality of this is just important to point out here. In order to convict Alejandro Mayorkas and actually impeach him, you would need a two-thirds majority, 67 votes. You definitely do not have that. You don't even have all 49 Republicans on board with the idea of impeaching him. Instead, to dismiss these charges, which is what we're going to see happen most likely, it only takes 51 votes. That's what we're going to see Schumer do, and that's what it's going to look like on Tuesday. All right. Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Let's turn now to weather. We've got a chain of severe storms that's going to continue moving across the plains this morning, and some of the storms could spawn large hail and even strong tornadoes. A lot to look out for. Angie Lastman's here with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. This storm system is going to be problematic for a couple of days for us with multiple impacts. So let's start with what's going on right now and what we have to look forward to through the day today. Notice we've got quite an active morning already across parts of the plains moving into the Midwest. That's where we're going to see the best chance of some of these uh, stronger storms here through the day today, but right now we've got a tornado watch that's in effect for parts of Nebraska, Iowa, and stretching down into Kansas. We're going to continue to see these long lines of thunderstorms working their way farther uh, to the north and east over the next couple of hours. And we've, even where we don't see the watches and warnings right now, we still have some uh, uh, quite a lot of lightning and some active weather going on. Could potentially slow you down for that early morning commute in this region. This is why we're dealing with this. We've got a storm system that's going to continue to intensify through the day today and then move to the east 
Northeast as we get through today and tomorrow. Today, the main impacts are going to be across parts of the Midwest. We'll have the potential for some really heavy rain, impressive rainfall rates at some points uh, across this region. So the isolated flash flooding potential will be there. We'll be keeping a close eye on that. But more importantly, 25 million people at risk for these stronger storms. That means places like Cedar Rapids to Quincy, down through Springfield and Little Rock have the chance to see all impacts on the table. But really concerning, uh, we'll watch for the ingredients to be there for some of these stronger tornadoes to develop. That means EF2 or higher. And the bullseye has places like Des Moines, Cedar Rapids and Quincy in it. That's going to last through this evening as well. And by tomorrow, the system's still on the move. So it works across parts of the Midwest, the Ohio Valley here for the early parts of the day. And then the East Coast gets in on the action as we get into the later parts of our afternoon for tomorrow. But once again, we'll have that risk of severe weather. Detroit to Louisville has the best chance and all of those uh, same impacts are going to be on the table. I mentioned some impressive rainfall rates and we will have that one to two inches per hour in some of these spots. So Minneapolis to Omaha, that's where we'll look at the highest uh, uh, the highest rainfall totals by the time we get through midweek, guys. Oh, I look sweat. <laughs> yeah, indeed. A lot Thank going you. on. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.